we walk out of a building and look up at the sky in bright daylight, it appears to our senses to be a vast and limitless expanse. And that perception leads to an ingrained assumption that surely it is absurd to imagine that we human beings could have any meaningful impact on something as vast as this uh, limitless, seemingly limitless blue sky. With that as a preface, I want to show you some slides, and when they conclude, I'll just give a few brief uh, concluding comments. This image from space, from the space shuttle, shows what uh, the, the uh, astronauts have taught us. Just as Galileo's telescope <coughs> revealed uh, the true relationship of the Earth to the sun, the, the sky is shockingly thin, and as the late Carl Sagan used to say, it's similar to a thin coat of varnish on a medium-sized globe. And even though the Earth is large, the sky is very small in comparison. And for a variety of reasons, we are now capable of having a great impact on it. The entire relationship between the human species and our home planet has been radically altered by the quadrupling of population in less than a, in a century. By, much more importantly, by the magnified power available to each individual that science and technology has given us, and by our obsession with short-term thinking, whether uh, in business being focused on quarterly reports or politicians on overnight public opinion polls or media empires on weekly sweeps weeks, and the neuroscientists have uh, explanations for our preference to short-term horizons but we have a generational challenge now. And all of you know this basic science well. The, the energy from the sun comes through the atmosphere as a shortwave light uh, and is absorbed by the planet and is re-radiated as infrared. And some of the outgoing infrared is trapped, and that's a good thing. Another of the anniversaries, and I referred to it, is that this is the 150th anniversary of Sir John Tyndall's discovery that CO2 molecules absorb infrared radiation. That, I'm told by scientists, is not controversial. It is rather like gravity. <laughs> it's quite well established. And here's a way of looking at its significance. Earth and Venus are almost exactly the same size, no more than 400 kilometers difference in their circumference. Less well known is that they have almost exactly the same amount of carbon. But the miracle of life and the unique geological forces here on Earth have, over billions of years, removed much of the carbon from the atmosphere, leaving that ideal thin shell, ideal in that it's perfect for the evolution of life and for the sustenance of us. Uh, but on Venus, those processes did not occur, so most of the atmosphere, most of the carbon is still in the atmosphere. What difference does that make? Well, on Earth, the temperature is 59 degrees, or 15 Celsius, and on Venus, it's 855 <laughs> degrees, or 475 Celsius, and it rains sulfuric acid. So, However uh, upset you were at the weather forecast this morning, it wasn't on that. Uh, and, and it really it doesn't matter that Venus, very much that Venus is closer to the sun. It's three times hotter than Mercury, which is right next to the sun. Indeed, all that CO2 is much more reflective than Earth's atmosphere. It has less coming in, but much more trapped. So this is relevant to human civilization's current global strategy of taking as much carbon as possible as quickly as we can out of the ground and putting it in the atmosphere. As we do so, this thin line thickens. And as it thickens, more of the infrared is trapped. 
And that's why the change in annual global temperatures uh, is so pronounced. And by the way, that's below that line. And uh, to go back one, you would expect that above that line, it might be getting cooler. So here is CSI climate. Above the line, it is indeed getting cooler. The 10, hot, 10, the 10 hottest years in the atmospheric record, going back only 160 years, have been in the last 11 years.